So the last thing we want to show to you guys is a program that was developed by Samaya Dodge and a student of hers. Um, Somi is Gil's, uh, was her postdoc when we were setting up MData. And she is, she's a kind of, she's a GIS expert and a geographer. And so she's now at the geography department at the University of Minnesota. And so I'm putting, this is kind of to credit her for what we're gonna be showing. Uh, this is, n I think she's working on making this program distributable um, through the University of Minnesota, so it'll be more like a citable, accessible online product. But what you have right now is, it's kind of like a work in progress. She has her students doing development with it, but she doesn't have, um, this is like provided with minimal support. There's no user guide for it right now, um, but it is, it's a pretty, it's a really cool tool. I mean, as far as what I've, it's, it's really nice. So, but you're gonna have to play around with it a little bit. I haven't worked with this current version um, much. But I will. It has issues with very large data sets. So if you have high frequency data over a whole bunch of years, it may get stuck or become very slow. So if you're crashing Google Earth and you're having a hard time working in other programs, you might have also a hard time with this one. But like, I mean, I was able to get it to work really well with like, I mean, it has to be really big. I don't know. Regular big seems to work fine for it. But. Um, to apply the make baboon test to everything. <laughs> yeah, if you have a million points for animal, you know that you're going to have problems with any suffering. So, um, so this re requires, you need, it's running on Java, so you might have, if you have any issues opening it, check your Java, what kind of Java you have installed. So when it opens up, it looks like, I'll close these other windows so you can see only the windows related to the program. So we got these three windows here. This one down here is kind of a log that's going to show you as what it's keeping track of what it's doing. Um, this one up here will become our map here in a minute. But first, we need to load some data. And so you can take your, if you've annotated your tracks in MF data and you got that CSV output, you can, that's the kind of file you can use directly as input for this. And um, you can browse to wherever. This is a sample um, track with Albatross data that that she, that comes with here. So we'll just we'll look at this one. Um, but you can browse to any other CSV with your tracking data, and then it it will help you visualize other variables. It doesn't care whether that's um, the temperature from the tag or whether it's the wind like the wind speed from that you've annotated. It's it doesn't matter, but so you can, but it, it will it will display your env data or other um, variable attributes in your tracking data. So we click go, and then if you so in this in this most of your files it will at, it's going to ask you it's going to say it's going to look for study local timestamp as the default timestamp. If that's not in your file, which it probably won't be, if it's an env data output, it's going to ask you to select what you want to use for your timestamps. So you can select timestamp. Um, and then, so what it's showing here in this top part, it's showing all the uh, column names in a file. And then down here, it's showing a summary of each deployment and the start and end. And then it's it'll figure out what the general uh, fixed interval is in the data set. And then, so, you can click which uh, which animals and which variables you want to include in your visualization. So you can unclick stuff that's not going to be interesting for you. Um, then you can create a title, and then choose um, at what interval you want it to create the animation. So typically, it's like basically the same as. I mean, in some cases, you're going to have different. Like with the Fisher data, there's different fixed intervals. So um, yeah, adjust that if you need to. But by default, it's just included the same as. It's just going to use the same fixed interval that it's finding in the data. And then you can choose the dimensions of the output animation. And then you click this button and cross your fingers. And so the background maps, it's loading from, these are all like internet-based ones, so uh, you'll need an internet connection. Um, and yeah, so what we've, 
it would be awesome if we could like post our um, our graded results or other background rasters on here. Right now we can't we can't do that, but maybe Somi needs a project for one of her students. We could we could recommend that. Um, so you can just there's a lot of functionality in here. So kind of explore it. Um, I'm going to close this little piece. Um, so down here at the bottom, we can see the time of, and we saw that Gil showed us this yesterday too. So down here, we're seeing time, and then each one of these bars is showing there's data for this animal for this time. And it's creating a legend. And let's see, we could do, what was I looking at? Oh, so it does have a record function. So you can actually, you don't need to get a, you don't need to use another screen casting software, I don't think. So playing around with that, I haven't um, experimented with, it worked really well when I, I the okay, yeah, it worked with the older versions of it, it worked awesome. So where was, base map provider, this is cool, there's actually a bunch of different base maps in here. I kind of like this one, so let's use this one. Um, so. As you can see, it's not animating anything yet, and that's because I have to click play. And before I click play, uh, I just we can walk through here. So this is going to show how fast you want it to go through it. Um, seek might just yeah. So seek is going to let you rather than just play the animation, you can go back and forth on your own, um, scan back and forth through time, and then you can choose how you want to. Um, how you want to display, how do you want to like color the the tracks, the points, sorry, the, te the font size is very tiny. Um, so you can choose like what you want, what do you want to use for the, the legend, you can choose different fonts and sizes. Um, but the main thing here is that we can choose from the variables in our data which, um, Let's see. So I can choose, like I want the vector color to be colored by movement speed. No, that doesn't make no sense. So vector, I think you should choose the U and V. No, tip, uh, win. Well, so. Cross the tail end. It's going to show, I'm not sure what, this is where we have to play around with it. Um, Vector direction and then the vector color. Do we can we do them both as wind speed or wind, wind direction? No, wind. When you want to do wind speed? Ah, uh, so vector length should be the wind speed. Vector color you can do what you want, and vector direction should be the wind direction. Because that's vector data. You need speed and direction. Yeah, and so this one is uh, this is all it lets me choose from this one. So. And you can turn them, you don't need to have, it lets you do a lot of different options. And I think for me at least at some point it's trying to give too much information at once. So you can, whether you want to adjust the line thickness by temperature, um, yeah, you can play around with it. And then let's say, I think line color, I guess we could keep doing it by tag. So that'll be a different, each animal will be in a different color. And so as you see these, what we're talking about vectors are these little lines that are showing up here. Let's just hit play and we can watch it for a little bit. Gil, do you want to explain what the vectors display? The arrows showing the, if you did the arrow length by wind speed and the arrow direction by wind direction, they tell you the wind speed and direction. If you had ocean current, you can choose the Ocean current, speed, and direction. If it can be, if you calculate the heading deviation of the bird and the movement speed, you can do that in little arrows. So the arrows are little vector information. The color and the width can give you other scalar information. So temperature, NDVI, I don't know, whatever it is that you. So you can basically put four different variables showing at the same time, one in the width, one in the color, one in the vector length, and one in the vector direction. But not all of them make sense, and often there's too much information, so you can go back to using the width and the color doing the same variables, so just emphasizing what you want to show, and not necessarily show vectors at all. 
Sure. Yeah, but what's cool is you can just like turn it, I mean, you can just play with it and keep it, like it is, keeps running while I'm changing the selections. Um, and anything else? Yeah, so there's a bunch of other options. So you can see it's fading like as the time, it, it, you could, if you could turn this off and it'll accumulate the tracks as it runs through, or you can turn it off so you can see the more recent stuff as it's running. I think you can control the length of memory of the track. So the track fades, the past, when you animate it, the, the past track kind of fades away, and you can control how far back in time. It yeah, so that's the fade duration and hours, I think, would be it. So now it's much shorter. So that's kind of it, but you guys should um, try it out. You can try it out with your own data, try it out with these or with the fishers, and, um, or you can keep working on the grid requests and the grid data. A couple of things that came up that I think probably a bunch of you heard, but maybe not everybody. One is, so they're providing the grid results in compressed files, and this is the what, tar.gz, and if you've got a Mac, that you just click it and you're done, but um, I think with, I don't know if, with a bunch of people with PCs, I'm not sure if everybody, you need to, yeah, you, was it unzip seven, seven zip? Um, and then I'm gonna ask if there's any reason we couldn't provide them as just ZIP zip files with that, because that should be compatible with anybody's. Tar.gz is much more geeky. Yeah. But does it, does geekiness, like is that adding value? <laughs> Other than for making Mac saying? users feel what good about saying? themselves? <laughs> um, so, and then a couple of other things came up. It was like people got results that were just all one color. Um, and so I'll say a couple of things as you want to like kind of troubleshoot your output and say, did I do something wrong? Or is this the real, is this correct? Um, if you have any questions, you can send me in your readme file. There's an access key. And with that access key, I can see what you've done and answer particular questions. Um, but other, if you want to kind of experiment on your own, um, you can try, like, so Anna, try, if you're annotating the Google Earth, and you're not sure if you, if you annotate that GeoTIFF, that's going to give you the actual data values. So that's going to be potentially more informative than just the PNG. Um, think about, so we had one example, we were looking at some co near coast ocean product data, and we're not so, for the, the land products are going to be masked over the oceans, and the ocean products are typically going to be masked over the land, and that mask might extend a little bit inland or might extend a little bit out um, beyond, like it might, the, the ocean variables aren't all gonna cover right up to the coastline. And so um, try experimenting with a different, change your bounding box a little bit to go a little bit more inland or a little bit out to sea or make it a little bigger um, to kind of troubleshoot, see if, you, see if, uh, if that might be causing it, but otherwise, um, yeah, so just like keep submitting requests and uh, try it a little different way and see what it looks like. Um, there also could be no data values because of cloud cover, depending on um, what what you're annotating. Um, but if you have questions, yeah, send me that access key. That's a good way to get for me to be able to help. Cool. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so I, that's the last presentation, I think. So uh, I think. Uh, Thanks to uh, Larry and the crew for running the camera. You guys, we're done, done with the, the camera stuff, so we can say whatever we want now. Um, the cameras have stopped rolling. Uh, they're going to, uh, we're going to get the videos up on um, <clears throat> on YouTube via the uh, MoveBank YouTube channel, and so they'll be available there for later uh, if you need to go, if you want to come back and get some more words of wisdom. Um, and uh, John is working on getting the presentations and the code uh, up on a GitHub link. So it'll all be available there um, in the near future. And we'll kind of have that link through the YouTube thing as well so other folks can see that. Um, 